Hey friends, I've been putting this off for a long time. I've, I just have not had the energy to get through it. And right now I'm suffering with some sinus effects and so forth, but I'm going to do it anyway. Let's talk about this much maligned hypothesis of Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, also known as Punk and Eek. No, no, that's, that's Eldridge on the left and Gould on the right. Uh, punctuated equilibrium. Punk Eek, P-E. And I say much maligned because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And not just from creationists, but from legitimate commentators on evolutionary theory. Daniel Dennett, for instance, ripped into it in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He accused Gould of essentially self-aggrandizement, trying to appropriate a Darwinian idea to his own credit. Richard Dawkins said pretty much the same thing and further dismissed it as not particularly interesting. But then, if it's not all about selection, Dawkins does tend to deprecate it. But here's the deal. Eldridge and Gould basically won the argument. Punctuated equilibrium is real, a phenomenon that needs to be explained, and is actually an interesting aspect of macroevolution. So let's first talk about what PE is not. The general public has often adopted the dismissive attitude of Dawkins and Dennett and further, this is one area where they'll even accept creationist misrepresentations. This is a slide used by Kent Hovind, and it's doubly wrong. But even so, I've heard defenders of evolution use this argument against punctuated equilibrium. They claim that PE is about sudden morphological change in a species within a single generation, and mock it as a relic of the long discredited theory of hopeful monsters that Richard Goldschmidt proposed in the 1940s. It's doubly wrong because, first of all, punctuated equilibrium and hopeful monsters are not synonymous. They are completely different ideas. And two, Goldschmidt's theory is actually really interesting, and it hasn't been fully discredited, although the idea that a whole population would change all at once is kind of goofy. So I'm going to have a brief digression here about Goldschmidt. I would love to talk more about Goldschmidt. He's, he's a really interesting character. So Richard Goldschmidt was a brilliant guy, but he was also politically maladroit, and he tended to emphasize the most antagonistic aspects of his ideas to his peers. The phrase, hopeful monsters, is a PR disaster, but the foundations of his work were important. Although said that, it, he kind of didn't do a good job on understanding population genetics, so there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's wrong with the idea. But what led him to his theory are some undeniable observations. First, look at organisms that metamorphose. What we see here are distinct morphological forms, but all of them have exactly the same genetics. For a second example, look at sexually dimorphic species. Again, these individuals have nearly identical genomes, but hormonal and environmental factors trigger consistent patterns of divergence. Third, Goldschmidt studied teratogens, chemical substances in the environment that could cause significant effects on morphology. But the results aren't total chaos. There are phenomena that recur in teratogenesis, as if we're re-expressing unusual patterns of genes in different treatments. To put it in modern terms that Goldschmidt did not use, he recognized that organisms are complex systems and that there are attractors that represent islands of stability in a dynamic process. He postulated that there couldn't be more than one attractor for a complex developing system, like caterpillar, pupa, and butterfly, and that there are system-level genes that can regulate the global pattern of expression. So not totally nuts and definitely not deserving of the opprobrium Goldschmidt gets from people who either didn't read his book or didn't understand it. But there are also some aspects of it that, yeah, do deserve extreme criticism. But most importantly, hopeful monster theory has nothing at all, at all to do with punctuated equilibrium theory. And when you hear someone equate the two, you've just been delivered evidence that they're hopelessly ignorant and can be safely ignored. That goes for anything from Answers in Genesis, where David, David Menton comes right out and asserts that punctuated equilibrium is a re resurrected version of Goldschmidt's hopeful monsters. No, it's not. Wikipedia gets it right. 
That's how basic this is. We're not talking about a unique macro mutation that suddenly changes every member of the species that neglects the fact that evolution is about populations and even a radically advantageous mutation in an individual would need to percolate through a population to make a difference. PE is a theory by paleontologists about changes on populations over perhaps a thousands of years, thousands of years of Darwinian gradualism, which are not visible on a geological time scale. There's a second big error that critics of punctuated equilibrium make. Creationists love to claim that there are no missing links in the fossil record. Let's just slide the obvious error there. Scientists don't believe in missing links either, and they deny the existence of transitional forms, despite the fact that we actually have surprisingly thorough documentation of millions of years of change in some lineages. They have to actually resort to lying about the quality of the evidence. So they also, though, lie about the theory. Menton tries to claim that punctuated equilibrium was born out of an absence of evidence, which is absurdly false. Eldridge and Gould proposed the theory to explain a body of paleontological evidence which clearly showed patterns of stasis. Further, if they actually thought that a single series of fossils would disprove their model, how do you explain this statement from their 1977 paper in Paleobiology? They document counterexamples to their theory, which is what you always do when you're presenting a hypothesis. You talk about the evidence for and the evidence against. They cite an example of gradualism that they praised as impressive, but for some reason they didn't immediately give up and declare their theory false. Perhaps because they recognize that they aren't making an exclusive statement about the only permissible pattern of evolutionary change. And from that same paper they explain their purpose. They are arguing that what is observed in the fossil record is real, and we ought to consider that, since most models of speciation are not continuous and uniform, paleontologists ought to accommodate the mechanisms and recognize that the phenomena they are seeing ought not to be dismissed as artifacts of missing fossils by default. The important lesson of Eldridge and Gould was that stasis is data. Many fossil lineages show patterns of stability over long periods of time. Why pretend that they're slowly becoming another species, or that there are intermediates in there that we just missed in the fossil record? Evolutionists explain not only change, but an absence of morph morphological change. Expand the scope. Embrace a plurality of mechanisms in evolution. Especially since some of this stability is obvious even to lay people and creationists. So this is a ginkgo leaf. It's distinctive and unique. Even an amateur botanist can recognize this tree just from that unique shape of the leaf. Yet here is a 40 million year old fossil, still distinctive and recognizable. We can't ignore this because some people sure won't. Uh, here's a page from Harun Yahya's Atlas of Creation. He's claiming that brittle stars have existed for 200 million years, all the same, and therefore, Evolution is invalid. This is his modus operandi for hundreds of misleading pages. In many cases, he's lying about the data. But it's true, there are cases where we see morphological stasis in the fossil record. It's true that there are stable, successful forms that persist for long periods of time. And that's a phenomenon that biology needs to explain. Not because some wacky creationist is using it to disevolution, but because stasis is a significant part of the story. And it's also one that does not in any way disprove evolution. So I'm going to step back from it and explain the real points of contention here. This is an argument about the tempo and mode of evolution, which are two terms of art that have been part of evolutionary theory for decades. So we're talking about changes in form or morphology. The question is about how quickly those changes take place, the tempo, and the role of those changes in different modes of evolution, like anagenesis and cladogenesis. Anagenesis simply refers to changes over time in a single species, while cladogenesis is about how change accumulates in populations that split. So you could imagine humans, for instance, gradually changing over time, 
but not splitting into two species. That's anagenesis. Or mutants arising and going their own way, moving to Canada and setting up a new enclave of post-humans and humans and mutants, then evolving and diverging afterwards. That would be cladogenesis. Another dimension of the question is how abruptly these changes occur. Gradualistic models postulate a slow pattern of insensible differences over long periods of time, which are only recognizable as distinct differences when you look back at the big picture. Punctuational models infer periods of abrupt turnover. Again, that's abrupt in a ge geological sense, which means thousands of years, not single generations. And please note, as the caption to this illustration says, all of these modes and tempos have been observed in the fossil record. Punctuated equilibrium does not insist that all evolutionary events are identical. It's a valid question to ask, though, how frequently each of these four patterns occur. We do have some idea that probably punctuated equilibrium is dominant. One example comes from this paper by Gene Hunt, in which he analyzed comprehensive collections of marine invertebrate fossils which tend, by their vast numbers, to be relatively thoroughly represented in the fossil record. He compared these fossils to three models. Directional change is seeing a long-term pattern of gradual transformation, that is, phyletic gradualism. Random walk means there is temporal change observed in the record, but it's not consistent. It goes back and forth. There are occasional changes in overall morphology, but none of it adds up to a long-term transformation. And stasis means the species simply does not change at all significantly over a long period of time, up to millions of years. The overall result? Directional change was only seen in 5% of the species observed, while the other 95% were roughly evenly split between random variation and stasis. If we contrast the family trees we see in punctuated equilibrium versus phyletic gradualism, we might see something like this, where we see the same branches and tips of the branches, but the path from node to node is distinctly different. In punctuated equilibrium, we jump relatively rapidly to a new form, but I, again, I repeat, not instantaneously, and not in defiance of known rates of change from population genetics. Because these changes are relatively rapid, they're easily lost from the fossil record. The punctuated equilibrium diagram is therefore somewhat misleading. Picture that same tree from a paleontological perspective, and you'd see it with all the horizontal lines missing. That's what PE would look like in the fossil record. It would actually look something like this. This is an illustration of the human fossil record without any attempt to draw the connecting lines of a pedigree between individual species. In our history, we have a diverse set of individual types of hominins, and although we have some general ideas about the linkages, there's also considerable uncertainty. One thing we can see, though, is that there's also stasis. Look at Homo erectus, for example. That's the most successful species in our family tree, and it persisted for over a million years. There are signs of some antigenetic change within that species, there is a rough tendency for more recent skulls to have a larger cranial capacity than the older skulls, but at the same time, this species stands recognizably and distinctly apart from the others around it, and the transition of the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and the Denisovans was relatively swift and poorly represented in the fossil record. Okay, so we can see it in even the human fossil record, but humans are a poor choice for studying the details of patterns in the fossil record. For that, it's better to turn to marine invertebrates, like bryozoans. Bryozoans are filter-feeding aquatic invertebrates, almost always colonial, with distinct skeletons that are well-preserved in the fossil record. Furthermore, they're nu numerous. They're densely populating areas, and we can often get a comprehensive sampling of the bryozoan species present in a locale over a long period of time. So, for instance, here are some fossils. These are examples of two genera of fossil bryozoans with their recognizably different skeletons. We can, for instance, look at different species of the genus Stylopoma over time and categorize them by the structure of their skeletons, and what do we see? Over 15 million years, we can see new species appear in that record, but the transitions are abrupt. 
We don't catch intermediates in the record. All of the red dots, each of which are samples at a time point in the species, stack up neatly on top of each other. That's stasis. For the other genus, Metrarodotos, uh, we see the same thing. Species stacking up with continuity over 5 to 10 million years. When we have a good fossil record for a group, stasis with occasional punctuated appearance of new species is the general pattern. Now there's another factor we have to examine. Punctuated equilibrium describes morphological evolution, the kind of pattern that paleontologists can see. It was described by paleontologists, so it suits it that, that that's their perspective. But there's another way to look at these organisms, and that's from genetic evidence, which you typically don't find in the fossil record, obviously. Sometimes morphological similarities and differences conceal substantial molecular differences. On the left, we have horseshoe crabs. There are four living species of horseshoe crabs. They all look pretty much alike and they've been around for about 450 million years and have always looked more or less like this. Like the ginkgo trees, this looks like a clear example of stasis. On the right, we have a hermit crab and a king crab. This is a diverse clade, and we, when, when you look at the molecular evidence, we are not surprised to see a fair amount of genetic distance between the species. Here's the surprise, though. When we look at the molecular phylogenies of horseshoe crabs, we also see a comparable amount of genetic distance. The story is that there seems to be a constant level of genetic change with genomes churning over time, which is an expected result of nearly neutral theory. But while one clade might express this variation with a concomitant amount of morphological change, another clade might be more conservative in maintaining their shape. How can that be that genes change without shape changes? We have to look at the mechanisms behind stasis. One factor is that selection is generally a conservative force. It acts to reduce variation within a population. In particular, it works to maintain the range of variation that has proven successful in one generation to the next generation. You will get change. Directional selection or disruptive selection, for instance, if some subset of the population is a better fit to the environment. But the key point is that if the environment doesn't change significantly and the population has achieved a local fitness optimum, Natural selection will maintain the morphology and physiology of the group in a opposition to naturally occurring genetic variation. So the environment acts as a strong force to maintain a particular morphology or physiology. Now another factor is you could have internal constraints that limit the range of morphological variation. We often call these developmental constraints. One of my favorite examples of that are mammalian neck bones. So all vertebrates have this chain of bones running the length of their back, which are characterized by their location and anatomy. Uh, the cervical vertebrae are your ribless neck bones. The thoracic are the rib-bearing bones of your chest. Lumbar is a lower back. Sacral are fused to your pelvis. And the caudal vertebrae are in your tail, which in humans are greatly reduced. You can see in this table that in mammals, there's a great deal of variation in the number of caudal bones. There's also variation in sacral, lumbar, and thoracic vertebrae, but no variation in the number of cervical vertebrae. All of us mammals have precisely seven. Okay, there are a few exceptions. Sloths and manatees have a slightly different number, but otherwise, a part of the deal in being a mammal is that you only get seven neck bones. This is strange. It doesn't matter how long your neck is, if you're a mammal, you only get seven. Other non-mammalian animals don't have this limitation. So swans have 22 to 25 cervical vertebrae. Plesiosaurs had over 30. Giraffes, just seven. Why? It's not fair. Well, there's correlational evidence that something about the regulation of cervical vertebrae numbers is coupled to some unidentified factor that is associated with cancer protection. Humans are occasionally born with six or eight cervical vertebrae. So there is a pool of variation in our population. But it's very rare because most embryos with that kind of variation are spontaneously aborted. 
and the survivors have a cancer incidence that is roughly 120 times greater than the general population. That's the kind of deleterious effect that's hard to overcome with any advantage to a slightly longer neck. And it's an effect only found in mammals. Clearly, it's not a problem in birds or reptiles. So we can have an immense amount of genetic diversity in the thousands of species of mammals, but this one morphological quirk is almost completely invariant. That is some developmental constraint. This isn't the only example. There's another one that affects all vertebrates, birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles together. That is, we only get two pairs of limbs. This is also a developmental constraint with deep historical contingency. When the first fish crawled onto land about 400 million years ago, they used an existing pattern of fins that were built on a blueprint that was established at a very early developmental stage. And early stages are hard to modify because changes at that point ripple downstream into later development and can have all kinds of secondary consequences. And this is an important point. Evolution cannot predict the future. Embryology basically dictated that only two addresses for limbs will be allocated. So you only get two pairs. And it would require a massive revision of the basic body plan to enable more. Imagine if, in the early days of the internet, they'd asked how many internet protocol addresses they needed, and they said, two, one for me and one for you. That's how short-sighted evolution is. This is not a necessary decision by evolution, of course. Just look at millipedes, where the limb protocol address assignment rule wasn't a flat two, but two per segment. Okay, I need to wrap this up. Let me leave you with a few general points. I have actually encountered defenders of evolution who have tried to argue that macroevolution was invented by creationists to discredit evolution, and that it's all just really microevolution over long periods of time, which is a draw-droppingly stupid thing to say. Don't be that person. Get a copy of Stanley's book. It's from 1979, so it's when I cut my teeth on this concept, and read it. I'll include a link down below just in case anybody wants more detail. If someone tries to tell you that punctuated equilibrium is based on Goldschmidt or on an absence of evidence, you've run into a fool. Ignore them or slap them down. This is another load of nonsense I've heard from both creationists and naive evolution defenders, by the way. There really is solid evidence for punctuated equilibrium. I've given you a tiny sample here. There is also solid evidence for phyletic gradualism. Life is broad and diverse, and there's room for all kinds of processes in evolution. This is not a zero-sum game. Now, it's still an open question about how much of each occurs, what specifically happens in each unique lineage, and I'd also add there are really interesting questions about the developmental mechanisms that conserve morphological outcomes from a constantly shifting genetic foundation. How do gene regulatory networks get cons translated into consistent patterns and shapes? Of course, that just means that this is a terrific subject for research along all kinds of angles. It's science. Keep studying it.